so first of all, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank OIST uh, for the invitations, not only to visit, again, as Rico mentioned, I'm here until September 1st, but um, also to uh, speak. I'm very grateful for uh, both opportunities. Uh, so what I want to talk about today are really sort of two separate worlds in some sense. One is not theory, and this other is this notion of uh, modularity or modular forms. Um, I should say this is not a math seminar talk, okay? So I gave a very uh, detailed math seminar talk on Friday, uh, June 24th here at OIST, and if you're interested in any of those details, just ask me and I'm happy to share my slides. But what I want to do today is to actually give you uh, much more of an overview of these two pictures and then talk about some very <laughs> recent work. So by very, I actually mean there was a preprint that was posted which is exactly what I'm going to talk about at the very end of this talk, about five hours ago on the archive. So that was a really good timing. Um, and really what that preprint and then also the, the details I'll talk about at the very end talks about this connection which merges these two areas together. And it really this is in some sense kind of the start of a much broader framework that uh, we're going to be working on for quite a number of years. So what I want to do is to start very gently because uh, I'm trying to make this as broad as possible. Uh, and I want to talk about what, first of all, what are knots? So uh, informally, the way you can think about a knot, what do you do? You take a piece of string, twist it and turn it any way you like, and then you fuse the ends. A bit more formally, the way you can think about a knot is that it's an embedding of a circle into R3 or R3 space. And a common way of representing a knot is via a planar diagram. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this knot, which is in three space, project it down to the plane. And let me give you one example, and it's going to be the kind of one running example throughout this entire talk. Um, so for example, let's write down what is called the right-handed trefoil knot. So it is a knot which looks like this. There are several things I want to explain about this particular picture. Um, so first of all, these uh, gaps here, these are what are called crossings. So this has three crossings. Sometimes it's called the three one knot, the first knot with three crosses. In fact, it's the only knot with three crossings. Uh, the way you can think about this picture, if you've never seen knots before, is that this strand is in front. This break represents the fact that the strand is behind. If you're looking at it in free space, this is in front, this is behind, this is behind, and this is in front. Uh, a couple of other things I want to mention about um, knots in general, in particular this one, uh, where we're, one thing we're going to be interested in doing is looking at the mirror image of a knot. All that means is what you do is you switch the crossings. So here, the mirror of this knot, which is called the left-handed trefoil knot, what you're going to do is that this curl, which is in front, is going to go behind. So this one behind will go in front. This one in front will go behind. This will go in front. This will go behind, and this will go in front. Okay. The other thing that we're going to be interested in is the fact this is an example of what is called an alternating knot. What that means is that suppose let's walk along the strand, and then what happens is that the crossings go over, under, over, under, over, under. So it alternates between those two uh, patterns. And we can see that because what we do is we go over, and then you go under, around, you go over, and then you go under, under, and so forth. So this is an example of an alternating. Okay, so the fundamental, uh, the fundamental problem <laughs> in knot theory is that if I give you two knots, uh, how can you test or find out if they are equivalent to each other? And here, what we mean by equivalent is you want to take a knot and continuously deform it into the, the second knot. And so this, what you don't want to do is you don't want to snip the knot and kind of reattach it. And also, you don't want to pass one strand through another. Okay, so that's what we mean by equivalent. And it turns out that this problem is uh, highly non-trivial. Okay? And let me give you an example, well, actually one of my favorite examples, uh, to hopefully convince you that trying to do this can, is, um, can be sometimes problematic, uh, depending on your experience with these sort of things. So let me give you this example of a Wolfgang Hawkins uh, Gordian knot, fantastic name, Wolfgang Hawken. Uh, so here it is. This knot, if you count carefully, it has 141 crossings, supposedly 141 crossings. But if you carefully 
uh, kind of untangle it, then it turns out it's actually equivalent to yum. Okay? So what we're going to be interested in doing is in coming up with these things called not invariants, okay? some type of test. So the idea is going to be if you have two knots which are equivalent to each other, then these not invariants can, are going to be equal to each other. Yeah, go ahead. Why does this not have even the name if it's just a knot? Oh, uh, that's, I don't know. I don't know why you mean. <laughs> yeah, actually, to be honest with you, it's called the Gordian unknot, but I, I, I wanted to remove the word, I wanted to remove un, un. I don't want to tell you the answer right off. So. Um, okay, so what we're going to be interested in doing is in uh, writing down what are called knot invariants. Um, so the idea is that if you have two knots which are equivalent to each other, then they actually give you the same uh, invariant. Also, keep in mind what that implies is that if the two knot invariants are not equal to each other, that implies that the, uh, the two knots are not equivalent to each other. Unfortunately, there is no known, as far as I'm aware, there is no known perfect invariant. So just because you have two knot invariants which are equal to each other, that does not necessarily imply that two knots are equivalent. Okay, so that's sort of the general setup of what we're going after, writing down uh, not invariants, and then relating them to the, the second world, or we're just still in the first world. So what I want to do, because I, I did view this as, as a very broad overview, I want to give you just a little bit of history, uh, and the, the reason I want to do that is because there are certain parallels in both worlds, uh, which I think I quite like. So let me give you a very brief, uh, incomplete history of a knot theory. Uh, and it, uh, so it, I, actually in my abstract, you may have noticed I mentioned the Book of Kells. So the Book of Kells is this, uh, spiritual um, Irish text that goes back to the ninth century. Um, you can look at it in Trinity College Dublin in the library there. And if you look at the corners of this book, you have these ornate, beautiful drawings of, of knots. And it's always a pleasure to, to look at these pages and they turn one page a day. Kind of neat. Uh, but it really starts, in, from a mathematical point of view, it really starts with a Vendermont and a paper from uh, 1771. You can also find it in Gauss's personal diaries. Uh, I think it's in 1784-ish. Um, Listing, Listing was actually a student of Gauss. Listing was interested in this property called chirality of a knot. So a knot is what's called achiral if it's equivalent to um, its mirror image. Uh, and it's called chiral if it's not equivalent. Listing actually conjectured that the right-handed trefoil is not equivalent to the left-handed trefoil. I'll come back to that uh, shortly. After listing, you have uh, uh, William Thompson, better, possibly better known as Lord Kelvin. Um, he was knighted for his work on the uh, first transatlantic cable. Uh, James Clerk Maxwell, we'll hear much more about Maxwell uh, shortly. Tate, Tate's really the subject of everything we'll talk about today. Reverend Kirkman and Charles Little. Uh, Charles Little was actually an engineer in Nebraska, and they were interested in knot tabulation. That will also play a role later. Um, and then what happened is you had uh, Emil Artin. So Artin came up with this um, notion of braid theory, and that really put knot theory on a solid uh, theoretical uh, framework. And this was really a revolution in, revolutionary result, revolutionary theory uh, in, uh, in knot theory. You have Alexander. Alexander came up with the first polynomial knot invariant in 1928. Reitemeister will see his moves. Although these moves, turns out these moves actually were uh, guessed ahead of time by Maxwell, which he didn't know in advance. Uh, Schubert, Schubert, and then possibly more modern setting, we have Conway, uh, Vaughn Jones, uh, Kaufman, and Vesuvio. Okay, so amongst all these people, list of names, the one person I really want to focus on is Tate. Peter Guthrie Tate, which the picture, this scholarly looking uh, picture, so Peter Guthrie Tate was born on uh, April 28th uh, in 1831 in Dalkeith, Scotland, 15 miles uh, south of Edinburgh. At least one person knows what that is. Um, so at age six, his father died, and then his family actually moved to Edinburgh to live with uh, their uncle. Okay, and it was really the uncle who uh, uh, instilled, I guess, into uh, Tate this love of all sciences. And so as a student, he was, he was quite good at all sciences. At age 16, he entered into the uh, University of Edinburgh. And then uh, one year later, he moved on uh, to Cambridge. 
So at age 17, bad, uh, he entered Peterhouse uh, College in Cambridge, and at the age of 20, he uh, became what is called senior wrangler in the mathematical tripos. So if you don't, for the, for the non-mathematicians, the, what that means is that he scored the highest amongst this series of extremely brutal exams, mathematical exams. Um, and at the time, he was the youngest person to have done so. Two years later, in 1854, he actually became a professor at Queens College uh, in Belfast. At the time, this was a relatively new university. It was only established in uh, 1845. Um, and also, I should mention that it was during his time in Belfast that he actually began a correspondence with William Rowan, ha William, William Rowan Hamilton, um, and you can actually still read their letters today. Uh, Tate was a huge uh, proponent of uh, Hamilton's uh, quaternion. Well, his uh, body might have been in Belfast, but his heart was in Edinburgh, and so uh, five years later, a professorship actually opened up and he uh, got the professorship and became the chair of natural philosophy in, in Edinburgh. Interestingly enough, he beat out Maxwell. Um, uh, and the reason he beat out Maxwell was not because he was a better scientist. It was actually because he was a better teacher. And when he got the job, it was actually reported in the local newspaper. And here's what the newspaper actually said. So in the Quran, what they said is, there is another quality which is desirable in a professor in a university like ours, and that is the power of oral exposition proceeding on the supposition of imperfect knowledge or even total ignorance on the part of the pupils. So I should mention between 1852 and 1854, he was actually a tutor for those two years. Okay. So he came to Edinburgh. Uh, he was busy teaching and publishing in uh, many areas in science. He was also very interested in conducting uh, various types of experiments and the experiment which is going to connect everything back to knots is this one. So in early 1867, he showed Thompson this experiment. Let me show you the pictures and explain it. <laughs> so what he did was he had this box, and then he cut a hole in one end of the box, and then he wrapped a towel around the other side. And then inside the box was this uh, mixture of ammonia solution and a dish of salt and sulfuric acid. So it created this uh, noxious fumes, and then what he did is he hit the back of the box and these smoke rings will come out. Thompson at the time was thinking about atoms. And so what happened is that these smoke rings would cross with each other and the structure would stay the same. And actually th watching this gave Thompson the idea that atoms were uh, knotted vortices in the ether. So if you don't know uh, what the ether is, maybe that's good. Um, the, the ether was this, <laughs> the ether was this conjectural fluid which permeated the universe. So uh, after that, uh, this theory, even though that theory was uh, debunked completely, it did give Tate the idea to start drawing knots, knot tabulation, because what he wanted to do was to create a periodic table of knots, because if, if the atoms are created of knots, we should keep track and write down all possible knot configurations. And so that's what he did. He began, began down the road of uh, knot tabulation. And let me show you one page from something he did. Uh, so there are many remarkable things about this picture. Uh, so the first thing is he did have help from uh, Kirkman, Reverend Kirkman and Charles uh, Little. And this picture here, this is, goes back to, I think, 1855. And this is uh, the knots, alternating knots with uh, 10 crossings. Okay? The remarkable thing is, uh, so first of all, he, he drew them all and he was guided by just intuition. The remarkable thing is there are no mistakes. This is the same table that we use today when we look at alternating knots. So there should be 123 of them. The other interesting thing about this picture is that he made a series of conjectures just based on writing them down, writing these down. Um, and I'm not gonna tell you all three of the conjectures, but I do wanna share one of them because it's gonna come up uh, just a little bit uh, later. So Tate's first conjecture, just says that, okay, a reduced, so that's a slightly technical term, it just means that you reduce the, you, sorry, you get rid of what are called the nugatory crossings. If you have kind of a, a curl, you wanna uncurl it. Um, diagram of an alternating knot has the fewest possible crossings. And so what that means is if you write down an alternating knot with say four crossings, there's no way you can somehow rewrite it magically and it becomes three crossings. Okay? That's the minimal number of crossings. And what this reduced condition does is it just takes it, you remove crossings that would kind of artificially inflate the number of crossings. That's his first uh, conjecture. 
Well, tabulation is uh, great. You can tabulate all you like. And in fact, um, I think of, as of 2020, all not up to 19 crossings have been tabulated. So there, I think for 19 crossings, there's something of the order of 350 million knots. So that's not gonna give you very far in terms of coming up with some general theory, um, but maybe you can spot patterns there. So the first result which sort of leads you to a general theory is the following. Starts with, really starts with Reitemeister. So in 1927, what he showed that what you can really do if you want to show that two knots are equivalent to each other is just look at their diagrams, okay? So it looks like K and K prime be two knots with diagrams D and D prime. Uh, and then we'll say, okay, so K is equivalent to K prime in R3. If and only if, well, all you have to do is just look at their diagrams. And if the diagrams are related to each other by a sequence of trivial moves in the plane, that's all that means, plus a series of three moves. Okay, these three moves are denoted R1, R2, and R3. Reitermeister move one, Reitermeister move two, and Reitermeister move three. And they're given as follows. So the way you think about, let me explain this picture. So what you do is this dotted circle means outside of that circle, you, the knot stays the same. So what you're doing is you're looking at the picture locally. Okay? And so locally, the idea is that if you can take this single strand and then have it be equivalent to this curl, really you should say, think about it the other way. Also, I should have mentioned, I really should have also included the other, you can curl it the other way and you want it to be equivalent to the single strand. That's Reitermeister move one. Reitermeister move two just says that if you have two strands, that's thought to be equivalent to uh, these crossing. Also drawn it the other way, or crossing the other way. And the most difficult one is Reitermeister move three. The way, one way to think about it is that you have this, these two crossings in the back, this X, you have this single strand which is in front and then it crosses over. Cross like this, you cross it over to the left and it becomes this way. And it's exactly if you want to uh, unknot uh, Wolfgang Hawkins' uh, knot, what you would do is do these right and moves and see how to, how to get it to the unknot. Okay, so the point here is that if you want to come up with some sort of knot invariant, what you have to make sure is that it satisfies Reitermeister moves one, two, and three. It has to obey or respect um, these, these moves. That's exactly what this, this, this theorem is saying. Okay. So what I want to do is, let me take a little bit of time and fast forward, because uh, I've been trying to go through the whole history. Let me fast forward to about 1984, 1985. Um, and in 1984, Von Jones, actually just passed away, um, he discovered, uh, a new polynomial knot invariant. So the, at the time, this was an amazing discovery because this was only the second known polynomial invariant after Alexander in 1928. And it was really for this work that he was awarded the Fields Medal. I think 1990, the ICM was in uh, Kyoto. Um, and so that's just absolutely phenomenal development. Um, the Jones polynomial is related to a wide variety of topics, uh, almost none of which I'll be able to uh, talk about today. Uh, and what I decided to do, uh, I'm just going to show you, and then just ask you to sort of well, just one example. So here it is. The Jones polynomial, the way you think about it is that it's actually what is called a Laurent polynomial. So that means you're allowed to have the exponents could be positive or negative uh, integers, uh, positive or negative integers, and here's the construction. So what on earth is all this mess? So the point is this thing here is what's called a Kaufman uh, bracket. It's a map which sends, if you're given a diagram, then what you do is it, it sends it to a Laurent polynomial and a variable A. This thing here is, turns out it's not a knot invariant. It satisfies right and right moves two and three, but not one. And you can fix it by multiplying, sort of uh, adding the appropriate uh, prefactor here. So this function is what's called the ride. It just counts the number of positive crossings minus the number of negative crossings. And then once you do it, once you fix it, then you can check that this polynomial really is uh, invariant under Reitermeister moves one, two, and three. So it is an invariant of uh, oriented knots. Okay, so that's a very sort of technical thing, but let me invite you, if you wanna go back, and if anybody's interested in actually doing this by hand, uh, you can, if you compute the, the Jones polynomial for the trifle, the right-handed trifle that we saw at the very beginning, it turns out this is just q to the minus one plus q to the minus three minus q to the minus four. I should also mention that if you computed the Jones polynomial for the left 
handed trifoil, then you, what you get is that it's Q plus Q cubed minus Q to the fourth. And the point there is that since those two polynomials are not equal to each other, that proves listings conjecture, right? Because the polynomials are not, the knot invariants are not the same, so that means the two knots cannot be equivalent. So that's the, the, Jones, the Jones polynomial. So what we're gonna be interested in doing, let me mention a couple of nice things about the Jones polynomial, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna sort of uh, generalize the uh, situation. Why is the Jones polynomial, I mean, you saw this construction, difficult, and, but you can do examples. Uh, and the reason the Jones polynomial uh, is of interest, it's because it's actually was used to solve Tate's conjectures. So in 19, 100 years later, so in 18, what, 1885 is when these conjectures were made, so what we'll do is wait for Jones to come up with this 99 years later, and then you can prove it. Um, so uh, Kaufman, Mosuki, and Thistlewaite proved the first two of the conjectures using properties of the Jones polynomial. And then four years later, uh, Manasco and uh, Thistlewaite proved the uh, third the conjecture, which is about piping. Okay. Uh, so there are many things we do know about the Jones polynomial, but <laughs> there are actually also many things we don't know about the Jones polynomial. Um, of more of a philosophical point of view, as you could say, why does it exist? That sort of thing. Uh, but the question that I that sort of piques my interest is the following. We don't know the answer to this question. Is there some non-trivial knot? What I mean is it's not the unknot, uh, with the Jones polynomial equal to uh, one. You can prove that there are infinitely many uh, knots, uh, inequivalent knots with the same Jones polynomial, but we don't know what, uh, this question. Both equal to one. Uh, and the best results uh, in this direction, one of my favorite results, is this uh, fairly recent one of uh, Sakura and Tunza from 2021 that says, suppose you have a knot with a trivial Jones polynomial, then there's only one of two situations that could happen. So uh, you could either, it could be the unknot, which has Jones polynomial one, uh, or it has at least 25 crossings. So it just depends whether or not you're uh, optimistic or not. Um, okay, so that, uh, I, that's kind of a nice, uh, nice result. What we're going to be interested in, especially as it links to the, the second world, is this, uh, this generalization of the, the Jones polynomial. So the moral here is that the Jones polynomial is one Laurent polynomial. And so what we're going to do is we're going to embed this one polynomial into a sequence of Laurent polynomials. So the idea is going to be the following. Suppose we have K is a knot. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about this thing called the nth colored Jones polynomial. I am certainly not going to define what this is. The way you should think about this is that this n, this is a natural number. So this is a sequence of Laurent polynomials. Okay. Um, and let me just show you one example of what do these things actually look like. So if you go back to the trefoil, it looks like this. So you have q to the one minus n, you have this sum of n greater than equal to zero, Q to the minus N capital N, and then you have the symbol Q to the one minus N little N, where all the symbol means, it's just a very uh, compact way of writing out a product. It's what's called a Q Pock hammer symbol. And so this just means that uh, whenever you see the symbol, it's just one minus A, one minus AQ, dot, 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 all the way up to one minus A, Q to the N minus one. So the A stays fixed, and you're just increasing the powers of Q. So all of this notation just means that everywhere you see an A, you substitute in Q to the one minus N. Uh, a couple of comments about this, uh, well, in general, and also about, about this example, you could look at this uh, example and complain because you say, wait a minute, you just said the color Jones polynomial was a polynomial. And this, the way you've written it, it looks like it's, it's an infinite sum. But it's not an infinite sum, it really is finite. Because what happens, you can check, is that this Q Puckheimer symbol, Q to the one minus capital N to the N, this is zero if little N is greater than or equal to capital N. So what that means is that this actually truncates at n capital N minus one. So it really is a polynomial and it really is a little wrong. It means you could have negative exponents because of you have Q to the minus little n capital N. So you pick up negative powers of Q here. Okay, so it really is a polynomial. The other thing I invite you to uh, check, uh, well, let me make a general statement. The reason this is a generalization is that it turns out that if you take capital N equal to two, so the second color Jones polynomial, that actually recovers the Jones polynomial. And I invite you to check that if you take n equals two and compute the, all of this out, see that you really do go back to Jones polynomial for the right-hand triple that we saw on the previous. Short check. Sorry, Robert. Yep. Yeah. 
curious question related to the open question. Yep. There are other integers that you don't know if there are any not corresponding to or that's a good question. That I don't know. That's a good question. If you change one to seven. Yeah. Oh, that <laughs> okay. Yeah. Oh uh, so if you pick then is your proves this is non trivial number. Yeah, that I don't know. I don't know. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, you can, can I ask again, what was the third Tate conjecture? I third forget. Tate conjecture, okay, very good. So it's about flocking. So what you do is, I think it says that if you have, uh, if you're given two, if you're given uh, two reduced alternating uh, diagrams for the same prime uh, knot, actually, I want to talk about not today. Then they must be related to to each other by a series of flipping moves. The flipping moves is that you have two regions and you have a crossing, and then you flip it. So you can take one and then you do some flips and you get to the second one. And you can do this for any two uh, alternating diagrams for the same alternating uh, knot. Prime. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. You already know what the, you're. Probably already know what the second one is then. Okay. The second one, I think it says that, uh, I think it's a, a chiral alternating knot have you arrived, if I remember correctly. Um, I, maybe I should also mention just the out of it. Well, okay, I won't say that. I, anyway, I'm tempted to say it though. No, okay. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut. So this is the first world. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to switch gears completely and start talking about modular forms. And then at the end, I want to connect the two worlds together with some uh, fairly recent work. So first of all, what is a modular form? Uh, so whenever a non-mathematician asks me what is a modular form, I, I, it, that's, it can be kind of a tricky business, but I always sort of, I like this quote. Um, so there are five fundamental operations of arithmetic, uh, addition, uh, subtraction, Multiplication, division, modular form. So this is a quote due to apparently due to Martin Eichler. Um, and the reason what makes this quote interesting is that it, the funny thing is modular forms have this tendency to appear in a wide uh, variety of topics, places where you would certainly not expect it to appear. So I'll give you the formal definition. If it helps you, that's fine. If it doesn't, that's fine. I'll show you. I wanted to really kind of focus on the applications. So modular form of uh, weight k, k at least in the beginning is an integer. What is it? It's a homework function on the complex upper half plane, such that it, it transforms very beautifully under the action of s of z. So you have this f of this Mobius transformation, az plus b over cz plus b. You have this uh, piece out front. That's what I mean by the nice transformation property. And you want this to be true for all points in the complex upper half plane and all two by two matrices in SL2, Z. Uh, there's also, actually, the, well, uh, and there's a slightly, there's another sort of slightly technical condition, but I'm, I'm that. But the point here is that what this implies, if you chose the matrix, uh, say, one, one, zero, one, then you would have F of uh, one plus C is equal to F of Z. That means the function is one periodic, and that means that it has a Fourier expansion. And at the point that here is that this Fourier expansion, uh, if you write out the coefficients in this Fourier expansion on a variable Q, Q here is uh, e to the two pi i z, or the complex upper half plane, then these coefficients have this tendency to contain a, a wealth of arithmetic information. And that's where these type of objects uh, appear. So they, it depends on what your problem is, Sometimes the, these modular forms can pop up. And so let me just talk about some of the applications, certainly not all, but um, I guess in some sense, kind of the most famous one is Fermat's Last Theorem. So Fermat's Last Theorem is this statement going back to, this conjecture of Fermat going back to 1637. It says there are no positive energy solutions x, y, z to the, the equation, definite equation x to the z plus uh, y to the z is equal to, uh, <clears throat> X to the sorry, x to the n plus y to the n is equal to the z to the n for any n uh, greater than equal to three. This was stated in 1637, but it's finally proved by Wiles and company in the early 90s <clears throat> after a considerable amount of work, and it opened up a brand new 
avenue of uh, automorphic forms. Um, they also occur in mathematical physics, um, in string theory in particular. Um, algebraic geometry, so for example, if you have some variety and you want to count points on this variety of a finite field, a lot of times that point count can be packaged into a generating function, and that generating function is a, gives you exactly a modular form. Uh, they also occur in combinatorics. We're going to see that uh, momentarily. Uh, and then as uh, Rico sort of previewed uh, a little bit earlier, um, and it's sort of great because about 48 hours ago, 48 hours and 36 minutes ago, uh, Marina Diasovka actually won the Fields Medal uh, for her work on the sphere packing problem. So I'm not going to talk about the sphere packing problem. I watch her do it. Expert. Uh, and if you look at her proof for how she did it, uh, it actually uses modular forms. So if you want, so it's a remarkable piece of work. Um, that's sort of the key. To be strictly, to be very precise, you use quasi something called quasi-modular forms. That's another important avenue. So what I want to talk about uh, today in the sort of the world of modularity is I want to talk about one particular mathematician. And the reason why I'm sort of choosing this mathematician to talk about is because this person's work is applicable to sort of what's happening now with this connection between uh, knots and, um, and modularity. So this mathematician, uh, again, I'm, I, I don't assume you've ever heard of who this person is. So this person I want to talk about is Srinivasa Ramanujan. So Ramanujan was born on December 22nd, uh, 1887. So here's his famous passport photo coming into uh, England. Um, he was born actually in uh, Erode, India, which is I think about 400 kilometers southwest of Madras, which is now Chennai. He was a talented student in all areas. Um, uh, that was until about age 15 or 16. And then he ran across this book and by G.S. Carr entitled a, a Synopsis of Elementary Results in Pure Mathematics. And uh, this is a horrible book, right? Because it, if, you have, if you haven't seen it, why is it horrible? So it's horrible because there are about 5,000 formulas just listed with little or no proof, right? And unfortunately, he followed this style. So he would write down his discoveries in notebooks, and then he wouldn't really say how he did it. Um, so he, once he saw this book, he became, in some sense, kind of uh, Obsessed, and he ignored all his other uh, studies. He actually flunked out of college, uh, but in 1912, he was able to secure a job as a clerk in the Port Madras Accounts Department. He was extremely fortunate because in this accounting department, his co-workers actually had a strong background in mathematics, and they spotted his talent. So what they did is they encouraged him to write to mathematicians at the time in the UK. And so he did. So he wrote to, I don't know how many, I know he wrote to someone in University College London. No, Imperial College, and they ignored him. Uh, and then he wrote to someone else, and they were very derogatory. They were not exactly uh, helpful. It's fine. He finally wrote a letter to Hardy, G.H. Hardy in Cambridge. Uh, and that's the first letter. So the first letter, I'm just going to read parts of it. He wrote to Hardy in uh, January 16th, 1913. And in it, he states the following, I beg to introduce myself to you, to you as a clerk in the accounts department of the Port uh, Trust Office in Madras. I have not trodden through the conventional regular course, which is followed on a university course, but I'm striking out a new path for myself. I made a special investigation of divergent series in general, and the results I get are termed by the local mathematicians as quote, unquote, startling. So in the beginning, Hardy didn't quite uh, believe these results. And so he worked with Littlewood and then they went through the letter. I mean, the letter is sort of a menagerie of results in number theory. I mean, if you look at it, it has like series evaluations, it has integral evaluations, it has uh, some topics in number theory, like if you want to count the number of primes up to x, getting ethnotonics. If you want to count the number of n, natural number is n, which are the sum of two squares, getting ethnotonics there. And it's just all over the place. But what they, they looked at the results and they classified them into three categories. The first category was already known. Uh, the second category was um, uh, possibly new and potentially interesting. <laughs> and the third category was new and uh, uh, important. And based on going through that letter, Hardy wrote back. So Hardy wrote back, and that started a correspondence, and then he invited Ramanujan to come to Trinity, to Cambridge, and he did. <laughs> so um, this is very brief, but for the next five years, from 1914 to 1919, 
he wrote uh, 30 papers, uh, seven with Hardy, uh, and it was a very broad, very wide variety of topics. So I'm certainly not going to go through all this. We'll talk about a little bit about partition, partitions. Unfortunately, we'll talk about Q series at all. Uh, finally, in 19, oops, 18, he was uh, recognized for his work. So he was named a fellow of Trinity College in Cambridge. Um, and then he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society of London. Um, he was ill, actually. So in fact, his last two years in Cambridge, he was in a nursing home for a time. And this might be due in part, in, in part to the fact that he was actually a strict vegetarian during, during wartime in, in Britain. Um, so in, order, in an effort to improve his health, he actually went back to India. Uh, I believe it's February 1919. Uh, unfortunately, his health did not improve. Uh, and then one year later, he died. April 26, 1920, at the age of uh, 32. <clears throat> so that's a very brief uh, synopsis. Okay, so what I want to do uh, to sort of highlight uh, the fact that modular forms can sometimes tell you something surprising is I want to talk about one of uh, his favorite uh, problems, and that was about partitions. So let me talk a little bit about the partition function. So I, I mean the partition function in combinatorics, so apologies, not the partition function in physics, theoretical physics. So what is a partition? So a partition is, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take some natural number and basically ask ourselves, how can we sort of break it up? So strictly speaking, what a partition is a non-decreasing sequence positive integers whose sum is n. And what all we want to do is for a given natural number n, let's keep track of how many partitions you could have. Okay? So let's, uh, let me, let's do some examples and then show you what Ramanujan saw. So uh, let's count the number of partitions. So four, so four, one, two, three, four, twos and ones. We better have all ones and that's it. So we have p of four is five. There are five partitions of Four. Let's do another one quickly. So p of five is uh, seven, and that's just because you have five. You have four plus one, threes and twos. You have threes and ones, twos and ones. You better have all ones. And then let me just let you check. Fun. Uh, the p of six is actually eleven. Okay. And this is all fine and good for small values of the. Uh, you can compute small values by hand. But if you want to compute large values, the, this becomes quite onerous quite quickly. So let me just say a word about larger values. So Percy Alexander McMahon, uh, who was actually in the Broyish Royal Artillery, he actually computed a table for all values of the partition function up to 200. Okay. And here's what he computed. So he computed that P of 200 uh, is a little bit short of 4 trillion. Well, probably one thing that everybody can agree on is what he did not do. So, at least I hope. <laughs> okay, so what did he do? So what he, okay, so what he didn't do, uh, what he did do is he used the fact that there is actually a recursive uh, formula for the partition function. So he used this recursion. And so the point, a couple of points here. So what you do can do is express p of n in terms of lower values. These numbers are hexadecimal numbers. And what you can do is you can define p of a negative integer to be zero. So that means the sum truncates. And um, this, so what it does, it can be small values, and then you build up and you get it to this larger value. Um, I should also mention that this is this is just a consequence of something called the Euler's pentagonal number theorem. Okay. Okay, so that you can compute uh, values there. And what he did is he published a table of values. And then Ramanujan saw this table. And then he rearranged the table and then he spotted this pattern. So what he did was, so P of zero uh, will define to be one, so then P of one is one, P of two is two, P of three is three, and P of four, that's what we saw before, that's five. Then you have the next row, P of five, P of six, P of seven, P of eight, P of nine. More values. And then what he spotted is what you see in red. Maybe I shouldn't have colored it in red, but it's fine. What he noticed is that if you compute p of four, p of nine, and these other values in the last column, that they're actually all divisible by five. Okay. And then what he did is he noticed that you actually have more divisibility properties than just five. So he looked at more values, and then here's his quote. 
<clears throat> so in 1919, he said, uh, I proved a number of arithmetic properties of P of n, in particular that P of five n plus four, so you look at that arithmetic progression, this is divisible by five, so this is for all natural numbers n. P of seven n plus five is divisible by seven. Again, this is for all natural numbers. And then I have since found another method which enables me to prove all of these properties and a variety of others, of which the most striking is P of 11 n plus six, divisible by 11. Again, this is for all natural numbers n. And here's sort of the best part. He says, this is it. So it appears there are no equally simple properties for any other moduli involving primes other than these three. So what he means is that if you try to search for a Ramanujan type congruence for the prime 13, it's never gonna happen. You're not gonna have P of 13 in plus some congruence classes zero modulo 13. Place 13 by any prime greater than 13. Not gonna happen. And that was his conjecture based on his data. Uh, so let's fast forward 84 years later after the advent of modular forms and Scott Algren and Matt Boylan paper appeared in Vinciona, they proved the conjecture true. And a key aspect of this proof is the fact that if you look at the generating function for the partition function, this is an example of a modular form. And they go from there. That's a proof by contradiction. Beautiful paper, short and beautiful. Okay, so uh, that's his congruences. Uh, uh, and also that's a, sort of another use of modular forms. We've seen the first letter, but what I really, really want to get to is uh, the last letter. This is in some sense that ties back to knots. So the last letter, so three months before his death in, uh, on April 26, 1920, he wrote, he only wrote one letter when we went back to India to Hardy, and this is it. Um, so this letter, if everybody can see it, it says, if we consider a theta function and transform, okay, Eulerian should go there, Eulerian form, and then he writes down some examples of Q series, and determine the matter of singularities that the, these are uh, um, these are roots of unity, know beautifully the asymptotic form function. And then the point oh, sorry, goes on, and then he writes down some asymptotic properties. So these, so these uh, what are called Q hypergenetic series. So what was the point in this letter? So in this letter, he introduces this notion of what is called, uh, what he called a mock theta function. So what he says is, I'm extremely sorry for not writing you a single letter up to now. I've discovered very interesting functions which I recently called mock theta functions. Why did he call them mock? Uh, well, roughly speaking, the way you can think about it is that theta functions, you can think of these, these are examples of sort of classical modular forms. And these other functions mock or mimic asymptotic properties of uh, these classical um, modular forms. Rough way to say it. And in this, let me show you an example of, of okay, they enter into mathematics as beautifully as ordinary theta functions. You see me in this letter with some examples. So he wrote down 17 examples. Okay, and what he called mock data function. Actually, he wrote down 17 examples of mock data function of certain orders, but he never said what order meant. He said, this is order three, this is order five. Um, so let me give you an example. So f of q, it looks like this. This is what's called a third order mock data function. We kind of now know, have some idea about what that means. It's related to the level of the modular form. So this is one plus q over one plus q squared, q to the fourth, one plus q squared, one plus q squared squared. And you can write this more succinctly in terms of the notation we saw before. This is an infinite sum from n greater equal zero to infinity, q to the n squared minus q to the n squared. So there's 17 examples there. Uh, in his last address as president of the London Mathematical Society, Watson wrote down three more, three. And then George Andrews, he found two more in Ramanujan's quote unquote lost notebook. So the reason why I'm putting these words in quotes is because it was neither lost nor notebook, okay? It was not lost because it was actually in the personal uh, belongings of Watson, and it was certainly not a notebook. It was about uh, 500 loose sheets of paper in which you had formulas just scribbled all over all of them. And so Andrews and Bruce, George Andrews and Bruce Burnt have written five beautiful books going through all of these pages and writing down all of these formulas and then finding proofs for them, if they're correct. If they're not correct, fixing them, then finding a proof. A monumental piece of work to go through all of this. Um, why are the why are these things interesting, it's especially for people um, in mathematics and then also outside of mathematics? Well, the point here is that there was this belief that they should be connected to what I talked about before, modular form, and that's re the reason why they should be connected is that, or at least that was the feeling, 
is that these uh, satisfy really nice identities. So you have one Monk theta function plus another Monk theta function is equal to some infinite product, which is a modular form. And those identities are reminiscent of identities in the classical theory of modular forms. So that's why there was some feeling that they, sh they should be, you should be able to relate the two theories together. So this is, uh, you know, 19, uh, we have to fast forward again and wait 80, uh, 82 years. So a Dutchman enters the picture. So Saunders Vegers uh, in his 2002 PhD thesis uh, solved it all basically. And he came up with this uh, framework which not only explains these 22 Monk theta functions, but all of the ones that people wrote down since then, how they fit into the theory of modular forms. So here, let me explain very briefly how this works. What you do is the missing piece is the following. Modular, this, these Monk theta functions by themselves do not transform like a modular form. So what you have to do is you have to add this error term, this piece, this what is called a non-holomorphic integral. In this piece, which is called a mock modular form, plus the non holomorphic integral, it does transform like a modular form. This com whole completed thing is what's called a, a weak MOS form. Uh, and this is, was a, a stunning development. I mean, I, I, yeah, so I'm, I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but I dare say this is probably one of the most important PhD theses in pure mathematics in the last 20 years. And let me give you a very uh, crude, so apologies for this, but a very crude uh, estimate of how important this thing is. Thesis is. So since 2007, notice there's a little bit of gap. There's about five years before people uh, understood the importance of his uh, PhD thesis. That might be due in part to the fact that, so he got his PhD thesis in 2002, he was a postdoc in Bonn for a year, and then he quit, he left mathematics altogether. Uh, but he was encouraged to come back, and he's back. Mathematics. Uh, and so since then, there's been about 200 papers so what I did, all I did, so this, this is a very rough and definitely an underestimate. All I did was I went into math archive and I typed in mock modular form and 170 papers come up. And then I checked math sign and there's 30 papers which are not on there. So I said, oh, it must be at least 200. And there's been a lot of conferences. Uh, the one that's coming up here in the Isaac Newton Institute is at the end of uh, August. I look forward to uh, hopefully watching some of those videos for non-mathematicians that might. Uh, if you want to read a, a very beautiful survey of work, I would strongly advise you to read Amanda Folsom's uh, Perspective on Modular Forms. It, it really gives you an overview of why these things are important, historical background, and also connections to areas outside of mathematics. So for example, there is some connection to uh, what are called what, quantum degeneracies of black holes. And somehow what you can do is you can package that information into a generating function, and that turns out to be an example of a Mark Modular Form. Uh, I'm hoping somebody who knows more about black holes can explain that to me. Okay, uh, I should also mention, if you want to hear more about this story, uh, Miranda Chang, who is a string theorist at the University of Amsterdam, she has done spectacular work relating uh, mock modular forms to moonshine. And you can watch any of her, her talks on uh, YouTube. They're fantastic talks. Okay, so that's mock modular form and mock theta functions. So what's been going on very recently, so very recently within the last 10 years, Don Zagier, who incidentally was the PhD advisor of both Saunders Vegers and Mariama. Um, he's a permanent member, well, uh, he's in many places. Uh, he's in Bonn, he's, he's a Bonn and also in Trieste and also in China. Um, he came up with this more relaxed notion uh, of a modular form. So let me very briefly say what this is. So he, what he defined it to be a quantum modular form of weight K. This is a function on the rationals now. So it's, uh, uh, it's not on the complex upper half plane, such that for all points in SL2Z, you have what you do is you look at what's called this error and modularity. So the point here is that this, if this was an ordinary modular form, this difference would be zero. But we don't want it to be zero necessarily. What you want is you want this function, R gamma, to have what are called nice properties. So they could be C infinity or it could be real analytic. And the point is that when you're strict to the rationals, you have this nice transformation property. And since the advent of this notion, there have been, so you can tweak this definition. You can, you don't, the weight doesn't have to be an integer. It can be half, uh, can be half integer. It doesn't have to be on all of Q, it can be on uh, subsets. It doesn't have to be on all of SL2Z, it can be on congruent subgroups. 
All right, so let's go back all the way to the beginning. What is the connection between sort of this, this notion of modularity and uh, those not invariants? I talked about the colored Jones polynomial, and that's what the, the recent result uh, is about. So let's go back to the right-handed trefoil and its mirror image, the left-handed trefoil. So what you can do for each one of these knots is you can compute the colored Jones polynomial. Okay, that's some Laurent polynomial. And then what you can do from this colored Jones polynomial is if you let Q be a root of unity, you can extract an expression. So this F of Q, which is the sum from n greater than zero of this fuck hammer sum of Q sub n. So in fact, what I invite you to do is compare this expression with the formula that I show, showed you before for the color Jones polynomial of the trifle and see that they really do match when Q is a root of unity up to the prefactor. Uh, and then it turns out also, if you look at the color Jones polynomial for the mirror image, so this not invariant, what you can do is you can play the same game and you can extract a series here, U of Q, something like this. And the point is both pieces of modularity turn up. So the, the theorem of Don Vaguier says in this first case, so here I'm, I'm being a little, quite loose here because you have to appropriately normalize this function, but this turns out to be a weight three halves quantum modulus one. So it's quantum. This thing which comes from a not invariant is this new type of modulus form, this quantum modulus form. In the second case, it's a weight one half Mach modular form. So it's something which is born out of this letter, this last letter from Hardy to Ramanujan. We have this modern perspective, and now we have the, we can prove that this is a, a Mach modular form. The point I want to make here is that all of this work is for one particular knot. And so very recently, uh, what we've been able to do is to uh, extend this. <clears throat> so as opposed to looking at one knot, you can actually look at an infinite family of knots. So what we're gonna do is to look at the family of what are called torus knots. These are knots which live on the surface of a torus. Torus knots are indexed by two coprime positive integers, uh, P and Q. Roughly speaking, P counts the number of times you go through the hole, Q counts the number of times you go around. And so you can check that the trefoil knot, T of three comma two, uh, is this. So that picture that I'm drawing here on the surface of this torus is exactly the first picture we saw on the, on the uh, first slide. Okay. So we weren't just interested in looking at this one knot, but we're actually interested in looking at an infinite family. So it turns out what you can do is you, you can compute an explicit expression for the color Jones polynomial for this infinite family three comma two to the T. When T is one, you get back the right-handed trifoil. And you can do something similar from this uh, beautiful formula due to Isaac Conan in Paris, published mathematician. You can extract an f of t function. And then what we've been able to show, uh, this is joint work with Ankush Kaswami at the University of Nottingham, is that this infinite family is also a weight three halves quantum modulus form, appropriately normalized, of course. And so this result, uh, especially in also connection to the original two results, it's part of a much bigger uh, framework. And it's really that bigger, bigger framework that we're gonna go after. That's what we're gonna spend at least the next five, 10 years on. And here's the picture. The general picture looks like this. So what you do is you have your knot K, and you can go in one of two directions. It depends on how the color Jones polynomial looks like. So if it looks like it's a psychotomic expansion, then what you can do is you can extract this U function and then you get a Mach modular form. If you go down this way and you, your color Jones polynomial looks like it has a non psychotomic expansion, whatever that means, uh, and then you can extract an F of Q and then we supposedly get the, a quantum modular form. And this has been shown, this picture has been sort of verified in the following cases. Well, that's what I just showed you of Zagier, a three of uh, right handed trefoil. We know that we can go down this way and we get a quantum modular form. Uh, result of uh, Kazuhiro Akami. Uh, who's in Kushu, who's going to come uh, visit me here in August, and Jeremy Lovejoy, they showed that you can go up this way. That's the result I showed you. You do get that it's a Mach modular form. For this infinite family of torus knots, 2 comma 2 m plus 1, Akami showed that he wrote down the non psychotomic expansion and you get a quantum modular form. And then very recently, uh, Eric Mortensen, I, I talked about this in the seminar, and I said, Eric, hurry up. And he, <laughs> he did. Uh, so apparently in joint work with uh, uh, Eric Mortensen and uh, Sandra's Vegers, they went the other way. So the point is actually Hakami and Lovejoy 
wrote down an explicit expression for the cyclotomic expansion for the Cutler Jones polynomial. But what they did not necessarily, what they didn't show is that it was a Mach modular form. But uh, these guys did. And it's today. So they posted it on the archive today. Uh, I just saw it this morning. And they show that it's a, it's actually, strictly speaking, it's what's called a mixed Mach modular form. So that's that picture. Uh, joint work with Ankur Swami. We have this side of the picture. We have no idea about this side of the picture. So there's an obstruction, which I'm not going to really talk about. I'm currently working, I'm working with, there's a Jap couple of Japanese mathematicians I'm talking to here at Oiston also. Uh, um, and so the picture, all of this story is for torsion knots. But there's a, a deep result of Thurston, which says that knots can be classified into three, category, three types, satellite, uh, torus, which is here, and also hyperbolic. And so a natural question is that for these other two types of knots, do we have a picture like this or do we have something, is the picture changed? Uh, and that is a, a long-term ongoing project that we're going to uh, continue to work on. I basically need an army of students. I need an army of grad students and postdocs to get this going. And finally, uh, Any questions? Also from online? Maybe I'll ask uh, one question first. Uh, so what do you mean by this quantum quantum modular yeah. form? Yeah, thank you. Uh, it has to do, yeah, so why is it called quantum? So one reason it's called quantum is because of the construction of the color Jones polynomial. Sorry. Okay, so the reason is that one way you can construct a color Jones polynomial is to use quantum groups. So basically what you do is you look at the braid uh, that gives you the, the, the braid representation of a given knot, and then what you do is you color the crossings by um, irreducible representations of this quantum group mu cubed SL2. And that's why he used the word quantum. Because the fundamental example comes from the color Jones polynomial. At least that's my understanding. Thank you. Uh, do these these weights associated with these forms can they act as like a, an invariant on on the knots you're plugging into them? Uh, um, not that I'm aware of. No. Yeah, I don't okay. know if they somehow classify what type of knots you're getting. Yeah, that that I don't know. I see. Okay. I wonder if you um, could help um, the peons and the um, <laughs> audience like like an engineer i wondered if this comes up in um circuit board design where you have to have the different um circuits and then and maybe these nods become uh, more um, um important in that in that um in environment uh i don't know that's my honest answer i was i was thinking about the brain because you have these massive um, axonal buses going back and forth. I wonder, maybe that that's also the brain has to handle that and to, for, to keep things functioning instead of a epileptic bit or something. But I'm just thinking. Yeah, yeah I don't know. I have one thing. <laughs> Uh, even if in, in the near future uh, uh, you end up establishing this, uh, fully seeing this picture, which connects uh, uh, not not invariants with modular forms, is there expectation how this would improve the understanding of knots in general, yeah, or vice versa? Yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, I mean, the only thing I can Say, yeah, so the, the answer is going to be big, so apologies. Is that there? The only thing I can think of at the top of my head is that there's something called the volume conjecture. And the volume conjecture connects uh, the color Jones polynomial to something called the hyperbolic volume of the knot. And that, in and of, that conjecture, in and of itself, is sort of amazing because on one hand, you have this Laurent polynomial, and somehow this Laurent polynomial knows information about the geometry of the knot. 
And uh, this, this conjecture has been verified, for example, for torus knots, because in that case, the hyperbolic volume of torus knots is zero. And so you get it, you get it right away. But one thing that the connection you could ask is that, is that the reason we're getting modularity so far? It's because all we're doing is looking at torus knots. Is that somehow related to this uh, hyperbolic volume zero property? Um, and that's what I, I don't know. I don't quite know or understand basically what happens when you get outside this picture. So for example, if you look at the 401 knots, if you look at uh, the figure eight, then there is some very recent and beautiful work of uh, cephalosclerophilitis and Don Zage where they talk about a generalization of the volume conjecture and talk about a, a, another type of modular property. But it's, uh, they have worked out some examples, um, and, but I don't think there's a general theory uh, yet. So um, somehow this polynomial gives you both pieces of information. It gives you modularity and also gives you information about the, uh, the geometry of the knot. So that's, that's what I would sort of say. I should also mention there, yeah, so this whole story is where capital N is fixed. It's actually a completely different story. This could have been a completely different talk if you actually let N vary. So if you let N vary, it turns out for alternating knots that the coefficients are actually stabilized. And a lot of what you can do is you can write down a power series which is built out of the coefficients which stabilize. And a lot of times these power series also turns out to be modular forms. And so that's a, that's a phenomena we also do not understand whatsoever. Why is that happening? And how does it relate back to somehow the geometry of the original knot? So what I would say is that both things are completely wide open. A very naive question maybe, but you showed in the beginning this Gordian knot. Um, and then you said it's uh, equivalent to the unknot, but um, is there any um, any re uh, relevance to, to this particular knot? Um, no, no, I just wanted to, just, oh, the only okay. reason I gave you that example is to show you that if I just give you some random knot, determining its, equ its equivalence class is, can be kind of tr tricky business. Okay. Yeah, that was just sort of uh, for illustrative purposes only. What is this duality that you are Oh, I did not explain this at all. Thank you very much. So it turns out that these two things are uh, related. And the reason why they are related to each other is because the Jones polynomial in some sense kind of satisfies a duality. So what happens is that if you compute the color Jones polynomial for your knot and you replace Q by Q inverse, then you get the color Jones polynomial of the mirror image. And so what that means is that when you extract this expression and you extract this U function, they also are related to each other via that duality. And that was a, a property which was first written down by a paper of Ken Ono and some, uh, some students in an REU paper. Uh, but that duality is what their word um, can actually be explained just using that property of the color Jones polynomial. And so what we don't understand, I mean, these are sort of two separate pictures in some sense, right? Because to prove that this is a, a a mock modular form that the properties that you use to prove this is a mock modular form is completely different than trying to prove this is a quantum modular form. And we don't understand why that's true. So for here, you have to get what's called a hecotype expansion. And that's exactly what Eric Mortensen and Sanders Vegas do. And that's why they get this thing here. But that tells you no information whatsoever about if you go down in the duality to write down the F of Q, proving that that's a quantum modular form. It's a completely different proof. And that's also something we would like to sort of connect uh, to each other. Yeah, let me also mention, uh, well, yeah, let me also mention, you, there is some indication of how to go back and forth. So for the trefoil knot, you can use what, uh, what is called a Q-hybrid geometric series transformation, and you can actually go back and forth between that F of Q that I wrote down and the U of Q that I wrote down. So there's a way to transform one into the other using Q-series te techniques. And so one thing that we're going to try to look at is see is that transformation that works in the base case for trefoil knots, does that somehow generalize to other families of, uh, of knots outside of torus knots? 
for example, if you look at the 401 knot and you look at its psychotomic expansion, look at its non psychotomic expansion for the Cutler Jones polynomial, can you somehow transform one to the other? And then you'd have the right expansion. And the reason why that's important is, for example, in cases in which we, we don't know how to do this one, right? This is all dependent. The reason we don't have a U here is because we don't know how to compute the psychotomic expansion. But we do know how to compute the non psychotomic expansion. So if we had some way of starting here and then flipping and going up the duality and getting the psychotomic expansion here, then we'd be in business and we could prove that it's a mock modular form. But we don't know the transformation property at that generality. Sorry. So is there a duality between mock modular form and quantum modular form? I mean, uh, mock, mod mock modular forms, there is a way, you, it's an example of a quantum modular form. You can, there's a way to explain it in terms, it gives you a, a quantum modular form. But my point is that proving that this type of thing is a mock modular form is completely different than showing that something like this is a quantum modular form. Sort of two separate techniques that you use to prove each case. And one does not seem to help the other. That's what uh, we're trying to understand. Why is that happening? So um, it seems like you're saying it's hopeless to expect that one can prove this if the upper stairs, if, up, if the upstairs is a mock modular form, oh. then proving the downstairs thing is a quantum module. It's not clear to me how to do that. I don't want to say hopeless, right? It's not clear. We have to wait a hundred years. Any other questions also online? Maybe somebody? Oh. Um, basically, this quantum modular form can be obtained from the John Color Jones polynomial in a sort of a Laplace transform process. Like something, there is something called the higher like year transform, which is similar version. Is does this relate to this? Somehow? Um, so, could you say a bit more about this? Uh, what, what type of transform this? So the Harris like gear transform is basically taking the variable Q and replacing it with the series a, well sum of the a, well lambda in the n, so we get the variable n instead of the Q. And I guess I don't know. And uh, like it has some nice factorizability properties when we're talking about torus nodes, but then not for other kinds of nodes. So I thought maybe this kind of relates to this construction here. Yeah, is that related to matrix models or is that- Yes, it is, it is related to matrix models. So basically there is a, something called the not matrix model where the Jones polynomial is used as a character and and then, uh, yeah, this higher the gear transform kind of uh, defines if we can construct a matrix model out of, uh, uh, yeah, or Jones polynomial of a node. So the, okay, so the answer uh, is I don't know, but I would like to see if there's a way to extract modular information from this matrix model interpretation. I mean, one comment I want to make, and please, please uh, clarify this if I, if I screw up, that. I, is there a matrix model known for for uh, non torus knots, like for twist knots? No, uh, there is none uh, because okay. of the yeah they, they don't factorize nicely in the case of non torus knots. So I guess the factorizability is kind of like a requirement for constructing a, a matrix model. Yeah, we should we should talk some more. We need to find out who this person is. <laughs> Okay, yeah, yeah, well, yeah. Let's let's definitely talk some more offline. Is that okay? Mm -hmm, for sure. Yeah, very interesting. Very interesting. Any other questions? Are you done? <laughs> uh, so your answer earlier about the why why quantum, and basically you said something about quantum SL two only and some representations and stuff. Uh, Lot of quantum groups out there, and a lot of uh, a lot of different representations of different quantum groups as well. Is like, 
Well, and a lot of not invariants. Like, if you get anything, why everything's like Jones polynomial, Jones polynomial, QSL two, blah blah blah. Why, why not study some of the invariants? You could. So the only, or? yeah. So the only other invariant that I'm aware of in which you can extract modular properties is this thing called the um, the Witten Rishitikin derived invariant. They, something called a un, there's a unified version of it, and in that case. That, so what's the story there? That is an invariant of three manifolds, if I, I think. And so the idea there is what you do is you take your knots and you do certain rational surgeries, and that gives you a three manifold. And then you compute this unified WRT of that, that three manifold. And in certain cases, you can actually prove it's a mock modular form. And it's the same sort of, you have to get this piece. You have to be able to uh, write down this hecatype expansion exactly what Mortensen and Baker's do, and then you get that as a mock modular form. So that's the only case, this unified WRT invariant, that's the only case in which it's been proven that you, you there's this connection to modularity. Uh, I don't know if anything has been proven in cases like, for example, the colored uh, home fly or these other situations, these other constructions of not invariants coming from other quantum groups that I don't know, not aware of. Any urgent last questions? Okay, then let's thank Robert again.